gave you the script yesterday. Where is it? We at SNL Newsbreak couldn't be happier. No, I don't think so. Christine Emerton. Yes, that is right. Welcome, everybody, on in to the Saturday Night Network for another edition of SNL Stories, our interview podcast where we speak to those people that worked at Saturday Night Live throughout its history. It is the most fun I get to have here on the podcast, just hearing these brilliant people talk about their time at the show. And I'm so lucky to get to do that with James P. Stevens Jr. James, how are you? I am great, John. We're going to have a great conversation tonight. Looking forward to visiting with Christine Ebersol. Yes, that is who we are speaking with today. So very excited for that. SNL Stories, if you this is the first time you're checking out, is our interview podcast that we get to do. And it's the first one we've done in a while. Very excited to kick this thing back off with Christine Ebersol, who was a cast member that is a huge what if for me in the history of the show. What if Christine Ebersol was on for more years at Saturday Night Live because she may be the most talented cast member ever. I mean, she's just such a triple threat. Um, She can sing, she can act. Uh, I'm so impressed with her. And I didn't understand at the time watching it the first time, like why they didn't keep her on. So I'm excited to hear her thoughts on all that and get to hear some of her stories about the different sketches she was in because season seven of SNL 1981 to 1982 is one of the weirdest seasons in SNL history. So I have to wonder, James, if she was on at a different time, there would be a lot more Christine Ebersol talk. Yeah, there would be. And uh, we will ask her about that uh, when we interview. But I will say, uh, you are absolutely right. Uh, I don't know that when you think SNL or you think Christine Ebersol, they're not necessarily synonymous. But if you do take a look at that season you mentioned, she is everywhere and she is extremely talented uh vocally uh you not just hear her uh giving a performance of a song which is a little uh musical sketches are 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 less um you know common these days but she's also giving the soundtrack to a lot of these uh, uh pre-tapes pre-records uh commercial parodies and stuff Yeah, I'm excited to get into all of those sketches. So I can't wait to do that. So without further ado, let's welcome in our friend, Christine Ebersol for SNL Stories. Welcome, everybody, on in to the Saturday Night Network for another edition, another season of SNL Stories, the interview podcast where we go back in time and talk to some of the greats from SNL history. And I'm so excited to do that today as a presentation of LateNighter.com and with some great friends, and great guests. So first up, let me bring in our co-host, James P. Stevens Jr. James, how are you? John, I am great because I have been looking forward to having a conversation with this amazing uh, individual for a long time. Yes, absolutely. And I cannot wait to bring in our special guest here today that we are so excited to talk to. This has to be one of the most talented people to ever walk the stage of Studio 8H, and that would be 1981 to 82's Christine Ebersol. Christine, how are you? I'm great. I'm so happy to be with you both. Yes, thank you so much for joining us. I can't wait to get into talking to you about your season at Saturday Night Live. I know that there's a lot of, you know, younger viewers of the show who are going back and watching old seasons. So they must be thrilled to get the opportunity to hear from you. So how are you doing overall? I'm doing fantastically. Yeah, I best broke my toe. But other than that, (laughs) oh no, I'm great. Okay, well, sorry to hear about that, but hopefully we'll have some fun nothing, tonight going through some. really nothing when you think about what it could be. Yes, so. yes, for Absolutely. sure. You just got to let that heal. But uh, yeah. yeah, hopefully we'll reminisce about some old stories and have some laughs here tonight, and that'll be a good distraction uh, for you. So uh, let's get into it. So let's talk about, you know, go all the way back to 1981 when uh, you are hired at Saturday Night Live for the seventh season of the show. Yeah. And we would love to know, how did that come together? How did you get cast on SNL? Well, I had just come off the road doing Guinevere opposite Richard Burton and Richard Harris, and I was going to take the summer off. And then I got a call that uh, Dick Ebersole wanted to meet me. And I think it was because he saw 
a screen test that I had done for NBC for um, was Tony Randall. Susie Kurtz ended up doing it. Um, but it was a, you know, part that I was up for. And, and it was a dramatic scene, actually. But Dick Ebersole thought that I was believable. So he wanted me to come in. And he not understood that I sang. And he, I think he wanted to add singing to just Saturday Night Live. So that's what happened. I went in and I met him and I met Michael O'Donohue. I never auditioned. And um, I got the job. Wow. I never auditioned. I mean, it was really, it was really uh, you know, like being thrown into the deep end in a way because I had, you know, I'm, everybody that was there was from stand up, you know, and I was just, you know, singing Guinevere songs for, you know, for the last year with Richard Burton and Richard Harris. It was, it was really a, a sh culture shock, you know. The way you described it, though, Christine, uh, sounds accurate because I think, you know, Dick Ebersaw, as we know now, is, you know, he wanted to do some different things, break right. the format of the show a little bit. So the music, I don't think never before and sort of never since have we had so many sort of musical sketches uh, that are sometimes tongue in cheek or sometimes just more artistic in nature. Uh, sometimes dark. Uh, thank you, Michael O'Donoghue. We'll get to uh, some more on him later. But w at the time that you were hired, you know, were you how much of a a fan of the original Saturday Night Live were you? Were you aware? Well, I, I was a huge fan. I was a huge fan. So that that was quite shocking to be to get a call saying, that, you know, come on and, and audition. Uh, come on and meet me. You know? I was and your cast, your cast mates uh, at the time, Robin Duke, yeah. uh, Mary Gross, who Mary says hello and a belated happy birthday. Oh, by the way, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tim Kazarinsky, Eddie Murphy. Yes, yeah, she she's yeah. great. Joe Piscopo, Tony Rosado, Brian Doyle Murray. Right. Right. So, Christine, you mentioned that you were a big fan of the original era of SNL and, you know, your era where you are a part of the show is the era where SNL is still trying to figure it out. You know, we, we got the Dumanian year. Now Dick Ebersol has taken over the show. Mm -hmm. And I'm so curious about that time in SNL history as far as, you know, what it looked like behind the scenes because, you know, we have a great example of the connections between these two times where John Belushi shows up in your fourth episode as a cast member mm -hmm. and he's there at the show. So I am curious, you know, during that Donald Pleasance and Fear episode, did you have any interaction with Belushi that night? And then how about some of the other cast members from the original era? Did they ever show up during your time at the show? Well, Bill Murray was a guest that year, too. Right. Uh-huh. That yeah. was in December. Um, but, you know, you just kind of met people because they were kind of around. You know, I met John Belushi and, of course, Brian Doyle Murray. Um, who had, he was, wasn't he involved before as well? Yeah. So he was hired as a writer and yeah. was there uh, from season three through season five. And then ultimately was a featured player on the show at that time. Yeah. Before. So we were together then, but, um, you know, and Gilda, I met Gilda. I mean, you know, I think in Lorraine, you just met people because they were just kind of around, was kind of part of the SNL family, it seems. So you can't you cannot talk to Christine Ebersole without mentioning some Broadway and some theater. Of course, you're coming in there after have done uh, done so much live theater. And though this is a live TV show, how how different or similar is it? You know, in the sense that it is live, but you're doing a show now that is like written in less than a week. Um, it was an experience that I've never ever had before. You know. Um, and it was kind of shocking in a way. Um, and it was thrilling at the same time, you know, because you're, you're used to, you know, the orchestra and the script and it's five minutes and all that. And then you're doing a show in six days and it's live. It, it was like just a totally different experience. Um, but it was kind of thrilling, you know, it was really thrilling. I mean, uh, I didn't, I can't say I had a lot of confidence, but um, I did have confidence in the music. So that was one way that I could express myself in that format, you know. 
you had mentioned previously that, uh, you know, you went in and you met Michael O'Donoghue, and it seems that a lot of people do remember your time at the show as you having a great relationship with Michael O'Donoghue. Like yeah, you were his... I just loved him. I loved yeah, so him. Yeah, so tell much. me more about that. He wrote that song, Single Bars and Single Women. I sang that on the third episode. I think that was with um, Susan St. James. Susan St. James, absolutely. Yeah, and um, apparently the light board just went crazy. You know, everybody was calling into the show, and Dolly Parton ended up recording it. That is, yes, for those of you that don't know the story that are, are listeners here, Christine performs this song, Single Bars and Single Women, on the show, written by Michael O'Donohue, and it later becomes a top 10 country hit. Uh, for Dolly Parton and Tom yeah. Malone the other day, Tom Bones Malone was, I was telling him that we were going to talk to you and he, and he mentioned this very, this very thing that he was uh, so ex And wasn't it Ray Chu, I think, who's now, uh, who played piano, I think for, for you on, on, on that one. But yeah. uh, that was the first, was that, I think one of the first, if not the first sort of musical settings. It was. That, and that was, you have to credit Dick Ebersole for that, because that's what he wanted to bring to the show. Yeah, I mean, it does make sense, obviously, because, you know, uh, Belushi and Aykroyd in the original days, they had the Blues Brothers, and that really elevated, you know, mm -hmm. them and the status of the show. So it would make sense that, you know, Dick and then Michael would, you know, focus on bringing in a cast member that could pull this type of performance off. So, you know, for you, was it just instant chemistry with Michael O'Donoghue? Because it, it didn't seem like it was just that one moment. There was like many moments throughout the fall where he just yeah. kept putting you in his sketches. Yeah, um, I don't know. It was like kindred spirits, I guess. Yeah. Well, what about uh, some of the other writers that were on the writing staff? Did you c click with any of them for some of the sketches that you were in? Um, not so much. Um, they, I think that people had, you know, writers assigned to them in a way, you know, like um, Barry Blaustein, you know, for, for, um, for Eddie Murphy and for stuff Eddie. like that, you know? Um, and I didn't have, like I say, I didn't, I didn't see myself as a writer at all. And so um, that's why I kind of depended on Tom and Tom Malone and, and uh, things like that to, to, to put me in those sketches because I felt like I could offer something there. We mentioned, uh, you know, when you're talking about the musical sketches, you're talking about Christine Ebersole, single, single Bars comes up, I think, first and foremost, but it's not the only one and it's not the only kind of, uh, well, uh, we're talking about Michael O'Donoghue, so there's a dark one uh, that I just love is the, I think it's I'm So Miserable or The the Last <laughs> Night I Killed My Husband, right? That's right, that's right. I'm so miserable without him, it's like having him around, that's it. Yeah. And painting the picture, right? I mean, you're singing and you're cleaning up this <laughs> this mess cuz there's which I think was Neil Levy, right? Is the is the person with the stabbed at the table who's your husband? Yeah, I thought it was Tony Rosato, but I guess it wasn't. Uh I was thinking that it was Neil. I don't remember for sure, John. I thought that it was, but it was either You're probably right. Yeah, that's from the Donald Pleasance episode as well. So that and I, I believe that was Neil Levy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But again, you perform it so beautifully and it's so sincere and it's just not typical SNL. It wasn't before then. It, it wasn't going forward. Was that also something that uh, I, I assume that Michael O'Donoghue wrote that? Um I think it was uh, I think oh. it was Joe Bottle. Um, oh, was it really? As well, uh, if you remember that uh, that writer as well, Christine. But perhaps in combination with Michael for that one. Um, I don't remember. Yeah, I don't remember. I just know that I thought it was very interesting when he wrote um, "Single Bars and Single Women." That was not a comedic moment. Absolutely. You know, and that's what was also new and different. So did he actually, did he write it for this purpose? Was that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because it was sort of like anti-comedy, right? It's just like. Yeah, it was like, a, yeah. It was so. I mean, he. Different than they've ever done before. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, people have talked about how 
some just, you know, had tension around him. You know, he they would talk about how he's like, we're going to burn this Viking death ship to the ground. And I just love hearing your uh, relationship just sort of being amused by his I don't know, quirkiness or just yeah. his, 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 his sensibilities, right? Yeah. I don't know. I just related. I could relate to him. <laughs> no. It was so funny because, too, you know, it was weird because um, when we first got together, when I first met him, I mean, the way I got the job really honestly was that um, he asked me, Michael O'Donohue asked me if I, like, had, you know, wanted to see some, like, videos of something. So we went into this other room um, at NBC, and um, he just took out a joint and said, um, do you want some? And I was like, sure. You know, so we just smoked a joint together, and that was, that was it. That was it. And the next thing I knew, I had the job. <laughs> this is this is the stuff we want to hear, Christine. Like, give us give us the, give us the don't, yeah. Stuff. Don't stop there. Don't stop there. Keep going. Yeah. <laughs> well, I didn't go. I mean, nothing ever. You know what I mean? That was right, it. right, was right. But I mean, the fact that that was my pretty much my audition, wasn't it? You know. Yes, that's a very unique audition. Um, yeah. I just, I also, I do want to ask you because we are starting to talk about the beginning of your your season at the show. So you are working well with O'Donohue, but are any of the cast members, of uh, the other cast members, you're, are you gelling with any of them where you're inspired to be in some of their sketches as well? Um, I, I loved everybody in the cast. So um, it really was kind of more a matter of how I felt I could fit in, you know, um, I didn't, I couldn't fit in as a writer and I didn't, I wasn't, didn't come from improv, didn't come from stand up. Um, you know, it was mu- strictly musical comedy. So it was, um, it was a different arena that I was performing in, but it was, it was more, I think it was more, I had to put it more on me that it was just sort of that that level of confidence that you know, I felt that I, it could be um, exemplified through singing and not, not that I couldn't do the other things, but I didn't feel that I was, you know, part of what made it happen, like writing and all that kind of stuff. You know, I, I wasn't participating in that way. Do you feel that, uh, you know, you, you know, like you said, you have these stand ups, you have, you know, kind of sketch comedy gurus there. Uh, I, I, I get the sense that you had some of your people uh, show up like, you know, Bernadette Peters, you no. know, and Tim Curry. Oh, no, 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 it was not. No, no, no. I mean, I wasn't really, um, I mean, I know Bernadette Peters from the, from show business, but. Right. But still there was not that. So there was not, not that as much. No. mm you didn't okay. match like comedic sensibilities with them. Um, again, it was just sort of a confidence level. I think you know this was such a brand new experience for me, something that I wasn't really used to. There was in that episode uh, a sketch, John. We had been talking about, I think, recently was the that sketch in the dark. You wanted to ask about, I think, right? Uh, yeah, that's a sketch that Christine. I don't know if you remember this one, but basically, it's a, a sketch that takes place fully in the dark, and you don't like they turn off the lights, so you don't see anything. I think it's one of the most unique sketches uh, ever, potentially, because you really can't see what's going on here. Um, and it's, it takes place in that Bernadette Peters episode. Um, Tim Kazarinsky's in it as well, and he sort of plays a version of you know the uh, standards of practices guy to basically be like, no, 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 you guys shouldn't be doing that. Like it's it's coming off weird because it's in the dark. And I think you are so fantastic in that you basically play opposite Tony Rosato. And uh, it's it's not a musical sketch. But I do think that like, you know, it's one that people should check out as a f- potential fan of yours to go see your chops in non musical sketches. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. Do you remember anything about that sketch? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, well, that was Bernadette Peters? That was, it was that Bernadette. episode. Yeah, yeah we, we can send it to you. Yeah. Oh, cool. We'll send it to you. Yeah. We realized this was uh, not just the other week either. Um, No, it was uh, like over 40 years ago, right? Right. Imagine. I guess the the connection I was just maybe uh, unfairly uh, connecting was, you know, 
you had performed uh, pieces on the show that then ended up taking on a life of their own. And and Bernadette sort of in that uh, sense that I don't know if that Making Love Alone that she performed on the show, I don't know. She does that so often now in her in her act. I don't know um, where that uh, came from, but I just, I, I, I that find Miller that. Is that Miller? I, John, do you know for sure? Who the wrote, Love Alone who, was Marilyn Suzanne Miller. Miller, yeah, yeah, yeah with uh, Cheryl Hardwick. Yeah, and yeah, Cheryl, yeah. Right. Who was married Cheryl. to Michael O'Donoghue? Absolutely, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Can I ask you something about? I don't know if if this memory. Speaking of Michael, because uh, we just mentioned sort of the Tim Curry uh, episode that I think comes here after after Bernadette, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it might have been when the two of them were doing Annie, the film at the time. But uh, mm-hmm. so Michael O'Donohue had s- written a sketch called Silverman's Bunker that was really intended to use Hitler's last days as sort of a metaphor for NBC president at the time, Fred Silverman. Mm-hmm. And it was and I have a copy of the script. I'll just say it that way. Um, and I know that it was because there's actually news articles that have come out at that time that you can find uh, that it was pulled at the last minute. And this Mick Jagger TV special uh, that Tim Curry plays Mick Jagger and, and a bunch of cast is in that one. Do you remember anything about this this crazy Silverman's bunker <laughs> concoction that Michael O'Donoghue had up his sleeve? Um. No, but was that sort of, did that spell the end? I think that was part of it. We're getting there. (laughs) We're getting there, I think, yeah. Yeah, because he tried to get that on the Donald Pleasance episode, the Lauren Hutton episode, the Bernadette Peters, and then Tim Curry. So it was like episode after episode that this tried to uh, make its way on the show. And I I think it was planning, I think they were going to have John Belushi come in and play a role in that sketch on the Tim Curry episode. But then partway through the week, they they cut the sketch. And then there's this very long Mick Jagger TV special during the Tim Curry episode. So a lot of people who have gone back and watched season seven were curious if you had any memories of some of the behind the scenes workings of that. Well, I, I just remember that um, it was the Bill Murray episode when we did um, Psychos. Remember that? Yeah, yes. at home with the Psychos. At home with the Psychos. And um, that was his last episode yes that was at christmas time do you remember what else happened during that very sketch you mentioned uh there was uh a breaking news story with the polish prime minister declaring martial law <laughs> and you're all you're all standing on you're all standing on the stage in the good nights and uh Bill Murray is essentially saying, Merry Christmas. We all, our hearts are with Poland right now. <laughs> Good night. Whoa. Uh, yeah. I it's, it, forgot about that. Oh yeah, it's gosh. pretty historic and crazy. Yeah. Um, no, and we do not expect you to remember all this. And, uh, but it's, you were there for a lot of really pretty interesting things. But I think more to your point, yes, that was that was his, uh, you know, Michael's last episode. And uh, I don't know, John, if you have a specific question, but it would be do, interesting yeah. to hear. Yeah. So I'd, lo- I'd love to know, because I mean, at, you, you do remember At Home with the Psychos, and that's a very memorable sketch mm-hmm. as being like sort of the, the last stand for, or for Michael. And I'm curious, you know, if you remember rehearsing that sketch with him and then sort of the response to it and then ultimately him being let go from the show. You know, that sequence of events, do you have any memories from your experience through all of that? No, I think it was a real big surprise to me when he was fired from the show. I mean, it was it was huge, you know, because he was the executive producer. I mean, he was a producer with Dick Ebersole. But I guess behind the scenes, um, they had, you know, disagreements, fundamental disagreements about what should be presented to the public, you know. He was very edgy, of course, and um, you know it didn't didn't fit into their vision. I think. Do you remember this being a concern for you at all? Because I could imagine you're working on the show, you're really clicking with a writer, and he's sort of championing you to get 
you know, your piece is on the show and then he's let go. So halfway through the season, was this, you know, were you worried at all about your place? In the well, show? I wasn't worried because uh, I had no idea. I was kind of blindsided too, uh, by the termination of my contract. So, I mean, but, um, I, I just felt like I had lost an ally, you know? Yeah. He, yes. he was somebody that was in my corner. Yeah. Did you stay in touch with him at all after he had left the show? Yeah. Did, did you do any work together after that? Mm-mm. Okay. Well, let's talk about the second half of the season a little bit. So, um, you know, basically the whole tone shift, in my opinion, of season seven changes in the second half, if you go and watch it, where you don't get those quote unquote dangerous sketches from Michael right. anymore. And it's a right. lot of experimental stuff. They're still trying to figure out how to fit all you guys in. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the big things is uh snl news break which was the weekend update at the time mm -hmm. and they sort of trying to integrate you into the news portion of the show do you have any memories of your experience on the news portion uh no i think people were rotated weren't they in those things like i did it for a while and then it was me and brian doyle murray for a while and then uh mary gross was in it i think they moved people around but, you know, I can't say I really, again, uh, the, the, the way I feel like the way I was able to contribute the most and the best way was through the music. I'm not that I couldn't act, but I didn't feel that it was anything, you know, that set me apart or was a special, anything special. You know, I didn't think that I, what I did on Newsbreak was anything special at all. You know? So here's a here's a question. Um, I, I well, I first I'll disagree because I think you were great on, on Newsbreak, and I think you had a nice uh, uh, you know chemistry with Brian Doyle. -Mer. Let me ask yeah, this first. I so what, the rela I was going to ask you about that. You guys seem to really uh, play off each other well, and 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 on screen just seem to really have a chemistry. Is that that sounds like that's true? Yeah, and you know, we did we ended up doing Sullivan and Son together on on TBS. And that was I don't know how many 30 years later. Amazing. It's crazy. You know, crazy. We hadn't worked in 30 years. The last time we worked together was Saturday Night Live. So, when you first saw each other at on that set, that had to be just Yeah, it was so great. It really was. And you know, we grew up near each other. He grew up in Wilmette and uh I grew up in Winnetka, so we were neighbors in that sense. Right, right. So, well, can I just say, James, the other thing yeah, about yeah, that, please. the other thing about your relationship with Ryan Doyle Murray on screen on Saturday Night Live was there was like a little bit of like a flirtation going on on the SNL news break <laughs> set. <laughs> where, <laughs> yeah, where you would like show up, you would do the weather report, and then at times you would even be the co anchor. And it sort of felt like they were making it out, uh, the producers of, of Newsbreak at the time, that there was a little bit of, of a love fest going on, some chemistry between the two of you. So, um, <laughs> just for me, I, I just think as fans, like, you know, we just love to get the the insight into how that felt for you or if you have any memories of like that sort of thing being pushed on you. I just love, I love, I, I just love Brian Doyle Murray. You know, it just, I don't know. There's, he felt like a brother to me, you know, but, um, have you been in touch? Do you still stay in touch or? Yeah. You know? yeah every, every, um, Halloween, which is his birthday. You know, there's like a thread from all the Sullivan and Son people because that ended 10 years ago. But we still wow. always come together for Brian's birthday. <laughs> I love it. As far as the relationship on screen with Brian during the SNL news break, did you feel like that there was anything there that uh, was like interesting behind the scenes? As it spent, uh, were the producers trying to push you to become the new permanent co anchor at any point? No, I never got that feeling. I got, I got the feeling that it was just sort of, well, let's try this out. Let's try you out. That's kind of the way I felt about it. And was it mostly uh, post, uh, post Michael O'Donoghue was Bob Tischler sort of leading that charge with yeah. the, uh, yes. the news break? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we, there are, we have a list of some other sketches that you were in throughout your time at the show. And I know that it was a long time ago, so you may not remember all of these. But if it's cool with you, I think, James, maybe we could run some of these by Christine, see if you have any funny memories or anecdotes about some of these sketches. 
Sure. Okay, do you have a memory of a sketch called Speaking as a Woman? And this is a sketch hosted by Tim Kazarinski. It featured all the women in the cast doing some impressions. You played Britt Eklund in this sketch. So oh, yeah. I have memories of yeah, that one. Yeah, I remember one. that one. Yeah. Uh, um, there was a lot of cleavage, I guess, right? <laughs> yes, yeah. That's, <laughs> all right. that's something. Uh, um, well, how about how about uh, let me let me parlay that question into a question about being an impressionist, which I think is something that you know people look for or producers may look for in an SNL cast member. So, do you have any memories of any fun impressions that you either tried to get on the show um, or did on the show? Um, well, shy die, lady die. Ah. Uh. I got to yeah. do that. You know, I was completely obsessed with her. So that was a thrill for me. And then, um, yeah, that, I don't know. Was there anything else? I remember that. I could read you some of the impressions that you did on the show and you could let me know if any of these uh, spark any okay. memories for you. So okay. uh, you, you did uh, Barbara Mandrell, um, mm -hmm. Britt Eklund, Car Carol Wayne, Cheryl Teagues. You did, uh, who was it? Uh, Andy Rooney's wife with oh, Joe Piscopo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that was funny. Mary Travers, you did it in a sketch called Middle Age oh, of Aquarius. Yeah. That one I remember, that was fun because it was KTEL Records, uh, Middle Age Rock. Was that it? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that was a lot of fun. I do remember that one. I mean, I remember the other ones, but they don't seem to really stick out. But it was, it was fun doing Mary because of the KTEL records that we got to do. You know, the night my quiz and I broke down, stuff like that, you know? Yeah, so those types of sketches, I think we got a few of them in those, that era where you would have like a group like singing versions of songs yeah. uh, on a rolling list. Yeah. Would they just like basically say, hey, Christine, we need you to sing a bunch of cover songs right now? Yeah. The Qaddafi look. Yeah, the Qaddafi look. That was so much fun. It was so much fun doing that one. You remember it. I totally, I can sing the whole thing. Well, wait. Actually, I mean, you want to try? So funny, <laughs> if it's so funny, isn't it? Because it's like those other things I don't remember, but the singing stuff I remember, you know? Uh, he's a liberated Libyan with an independent mind. He's a dominating leader who is working overtime. He's got the look the third world is after. He wants to be the open master, drilling, woo, -woo killing, woo, woo, invading Chad. Gaddafi has the look that's bad. The Gaddafi look. And then it says, whether you're invading your territorial waters or just cutting off a criminal's hand, do it in style and closed by Colonel Muammar Gaddafi. The Gaddafi look. Yep. Bravo. I, I, lo I love great. Yeah, hearing 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 your vocals tonight is just. Uh, I think there was a Trans Eastern uh, oh, that's commercial right. too. It's like flying right? in a cattle car with wings. That one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. this is so much fun this is so, so yeah i mean there was they had their their own you oh know. and then there was jesus in blue jeans too it's my party and i'll pray if i want to <laughs> yeah yeah that was from the james coburn episode as well those were a fun time yeah do you have any memories of a sketch called uh everybody does merman that yes. was uh, uh -huh. There's no people like show people. Yeah. Yes. And everybody could, everybody can do Merman. Everybody can. Who wrote that sketch? Do you have any recollection? I, don't know, but I remember Brian Doyle Murray was called the Merman Zone. Remember? And yes. it was, he came on as like, um, you know, Rod Serling. Yes. Like it was. Da, da, yes. Da, 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 yes, that is true. Yes, that is a fantastic sketch. I think a lot of people love it. To, to, even just to see you get excited as it, as it comes back to you. I'm jumping around here when I say this, but I know you were there, uh, if I'm not mistaken, for the 40th anniversary celebration. Yeah. Um, about 10 years ago. And because uh, you uh, were there, you looked great. You were on the red carpet. They did all the photos and all that kind of stuff. What was it like to 
to to go back and just sort of see everybody and you know experience that because it's such a unique like it's like you guys went to everybody who's been a, a cast member always talks about how it's like they're they're your people and you like went to war together or something like you know yeah. so there's that special bond yeah that's true there is and i you know i was only in it for a year but uh it was very you know it was very special it was I'm glad I had the experience, you know, as difficult as it was, again, because it was so different than what anything I was ever, you know, ever encountered in my career. And um, yet it just, it, the people were so great and it was very exciting to, um, oh, there was another one. Um, what was the other one about supply? It's beginning to be supply side Christmas. The one I did with um about Reaganomics. Reaganomics. Yeah, that was with right. um, Paul Piscopo. And we had, you know, our mink coats on and we're playing rich, you know, Republicans or whatever, singing about supply side Christmas. And I remember this was on live TV. <laughs> they had snowflakes coming down. And they were plastic snowflakes. And I went to take a breath, you know, to sing my next phrase, and a piece of plastic snow went to the back of my throat. I thought, oh, good God, what am I going to do? Because I, I was choking, but it was live television. So it's those kind of things, you know, that were just so thrilling and exciting, and you couldn't, you couldn't say, stop, stop, I'm choking on a plastic piece of snow. You couldn't do that. You just had to... I don't know how I got through it, but I did. And it was because of knowing that I was on live television and there was no cuts. You know, there was no, no like, cuts. Stop, wait, let's do it over again. There was none of that. And so that, you know, the stakes were high. The stakes were really high. What you're just describing, did, did, did that kind of, you know, live atmosphere, which there's other ways to be, but, but the, fast production schedule of that week of that show um prepare you for other things um yeah i guess i i how could you see it not i don't i don't i'm not sure like directly how it did but it's just it's all like preparing you for you know to be ready <laughs> to be you know to have your life vest on, I guess, you know, because you yeah. don't know what, you don't know what's going to be. I mean, I was thinking about like just coming off the road with Camelot and that's yeah. a show where I literally learned the part in three days. I went in on Monday to Toronto and Friday we opened for an audience of, of, um, 3,000 people with Richard. Because you, you were replacing someone, right? Someone, yeah. And they said, hey, kid, can you open by Friday? And I was like, sure. You know, what do I know? <laughs> it's yeah. the naivete that got me through. But um, I guess it's that kind of, that sense of adventure, maybe? And just like, just, just, you know, walking on the edge of the cliff, you know, but somehow knowing that you're not going to fall off. I don't know. Well, and you're truly an artist. Uh, and to try to get in the mind of an artist, this is where, you know, see if this question even can be answered or makes sense. But uh, I'm going to compare this to, to from Broadway to SNL. But so what show... What are, what are the shows that you've done on Broadway where you've done uh, the longest run? The longest run I've ever done is a year, which is the contract. I, I've never renewed a contract ever in my life. And so in those years, it's how many shows approximately? I've done about maybe 14 or 15 Broadway shows. And then but, for, but for a year, you're, you're, you're doing the number of shows in a year is like, Oh, yeah. You're doing eight shows a week. That's true. Eight shows a week and well, multiply are, that by... You know, it's the same script for the whole year. That's the difference. Well, uh, right. Which I was going to say is how do you, you know, you're an artist. So you've done this show, you know, uh, a couple hundred times now. And when you're when you're there on stage, you've got the audience there. They That's their first time, you sure. know, and you're bringing your, your best. And 
I'm just curious how you do that after you've been, you know, day after day, week after week. And then SNL is like, couldn't be like the polar, more polar opposite where it's like one time and what that is, right? Is just, you can't even compare the two. No, you can't. You really can't. And they each, they each have their own merits, you know? Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. I just, uh, I always uh, marvel at the Broadway folks who've been doing it for so long to just go, you know. Well, I think what makes it new is the audience. Absolutely. That's what makes it new every night. It's, it's, like, a, it's like an invited character that comes to the show. So that's what keeps it new. Absolutely. So, Christine, I want to ask you, you know, when you were wrapping up season seven of the show, your season on uh, your, your only season at the show, did you feel good about your season? Like, how were you feeling at the end? I felt good about it. Yeah, I felt good about it. So you had mentioned that it was a surprise to you that you were like, a surprise, oh. but then when you think back on it, you know, it's it was. um It was very high stress. And I think, again, um, the, the confidence level for me informed just the kind of way that I saw things. Um, and it was very much, um, it was a man's world. Mm. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I'm, I'm, I'm totally for that, you know, but it just, it felt like it was hard for me to, um, find my position. So I, I have to put it on me because, you know, like I say, it was, it was my relationship to this arena. And I think I did well, but I don't think that um, my confidence met the, the the level of achievement. You know, in other words, I did better than I believed. Or well, I, thought. I think that's really interesting that you say that because it doesn't come across. You know, going back and watching the sketches, it doesn't come across on screen. If no, anything, it, doesn't. I, it really doesn't. I know that. I can see that, but I think the internal the internal mechanism was uh, frightened, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> you know, because it's not that I didn't have confidence, not that I didn't know that I could, you know, deliver a punchline or, you know, do a sh do that. But it, it was, it was really more in the way that I was able to contribute. I didn't feel that I was, that my, contribution could match what everybody else was doing, you know, writing and, and all of that kind of stuff, you know, proposing, proposing sketches and things like that. I couldn't offer that. And so I think that that made me feel like I wasn't, um, I wasn't an equal in that way. Do you feel that, you know, if you had gone, if you had gotten the show later on in your life, you may have uh, you know, survive more than one season on it? I don't know. I don't, yeah. I don't know. Cause it's interesting. Cause, cause it, you know, you, you are saying, uh, you know, it came from some sort of, not that you weren't a confident person, but that mm -hmm. at the time you weren't confident necessarily to do the things on the show that led other people to stay yeah. past one season. Yeah. And yeah. I'm wondering if some of those, um, skills were, were better developed, you know, from your experience after the show so much so that you're like, well, if I only knew what I knew, then I think I could have had a very long career at Saturday Night Live. Um, well, I think that it, that my talent was better expressed in a different arena. Right. That's fair. Yeah. I do want to ask you, uh, Christine, if you do you ever watch Saturday Night Live now? No. Okay. Uh, one of the reasons that we wanted to talk to you today was because obviously, I mean, we're very curious about your thoughts about your time at the show, but there is a new cast member that was hired. Believe it or not, now we're in season 49 of the show. So there, there is. Yeah, it's hard to believe, right? But uh, 
Yeah, there is a new cla- a cast member named Chloe Trost, and she is a fantastic singer. I think one of the best singers that the show has ever had. And to start off her career at the show in this, her first season, she had a couple sketches that were revolved around her singing at the show. And instantly when I saw her, I thought of you because I was like, you know, this was, I wonder if she was cast because like as the singer. So I know you don't know Chloe and I know you haven't watched the show this season, but if you could advise a younger cast member coming on the show who is really known for singing and performing, what would you say to them? Um, I would just say, you know, um, have a ball doing what you're doing and don't question, uh, your position. I mean, not that they ever were, you know, I mean, cause I'm, they're not me. So that whatever their internal struggles are or questions are, are them are unique to themselves. but. Um, that's what I, maybe that's what I would say to my younger self, you know, that makes sense. Don't question. I think that's great. And, and similar to that, uh, question to, you know, Chloe Trost and the current cast, I just have to ask, and John, you know this, but I mean, if reading the credits of Christine, all the television programs, all of the films, some great things like Tootsie and Amadeus, you know, things that are just like on the, uh, you know, must watch. Um, I'm going to ask about this one only because there's the SNL connection. And I wonder if on set uh, you have any conversations, but you did Black Sheep with Chris Farley and David Spade. Yeah, And, you know, those guys were, uh, you know, got their start arguably at, at SNL. So I wondered if that ever ha- came up during your time working with those guys. I don't know. I think it was just kind of like common, you know, it was just kind of what we knew that about each other, you know? Right, right. Um, yeah, those are, you know, it was great. It was so much, it was such a great experience working with both of them. Yeah. Something I'll never forget. Yeah. So, uh, Christine, we have some of our patrons who are uh, supporters of our show, and I told them that we were going to be speaking to you. And one question that they asked me to ask you was your last name being the same, a different spelling, but the same as Dick Eversall. Right. I think for decades, people were asking online, like, is Christine Eversall related to Dick Eversall? But did you have mm-hmm. any funny you know, stories about either being asked that question or being mistaken for being related yeah, to Deborah Sullivan. I thought that um, it was um, you know, that got me on the show and that he was my husband or my brother or, you know, it was that kind of thing. Yes. Uh, right. <laughs> so. And I think, you know, it's not a common name. So um, I think there was a. Uh, a kinship, you know, that we had together that because we shared the common name that was not a common name, even though he didn't have an E on it and I had an E on it. But it's interesting how, like, you know, later on when I'd see him through the years, I always knew that we were inextricably linked because he would get his name spelled with an E and I would get mine spelled without the E, you know, so it was just, it was interesting that way. Was he one of the, I assume, did you see him at the 40th or have you? We didn't go. He, he didn't oh, go. he didn't go. That's right. He didn't go. That's right. Did you see any of your castmates there? Um, Eddie was there, of course. Um, yes, yeah. Eddie was there. Joe. Yeah, it was such a, it was such a, oh my gosh. Such a crazy, I mean, the amount of, the, the just the number of people that were there was just overwhelming. Yeah. So, Christine, I think that this was absolutely great to get to talk to you about your time with the show. I mean, I know it is, is, it is difficult to do an interview about something that you did 40 years ago, but I appreciate all of your you know, willingness to go back and reminisce and give us your thoughts. Is there anything else about your season, your time at the show that if you could just like have the opportunity to talk to SNL fans that you would love to say to them. That I love you all. And I'm so grateful 
that I had this opportunity. Oh my gosh. Is it crazy for you that people are going back now who maybe were born much after your time at the show and they're like, now they're seeing everything that you did for an entire year at SNL? Is that weird for you? Uh, not that to, not that I would even know about it, but no, I guess not. I, I mean, that's the fascinating thing that I, I hope you can uh, somewhat appreciate and reflect upon, which is because of just the technology of it all, there's just young, younger people, you know, n- new generations of folks who are finding your work from that long ago and in love with it. And I think that, you know, high school, high schools, you know, are known for having like these superlatives, like the person who's most likely to succeed and and all that kind of stuff. If there were SNL superlatives, I'm here buying saying that you are up there as probably without a doubt, most musical. Wow. That's what you're known. That's what you're known for. And it's, and it's, you, you you brought from, from the recording of the, you know, commercial parodies to stopping the comedy even and, and, yeah. and wiping the slate clean and giving you the spotlight. It's, 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 it's pretty special. And this is uh, an honor to speak to you, Christine. I'm, Thank I'm you. so grateful. So I am so grateful that I've had the opportunity and I'm so grateful that you brought it all back for me. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is, this is fantastic. I mean, I, I certainly wish after going back and watching the old seasons that we had gotten more of you on the show that you extended your time there, but I am also grateful Here's for all the, the projects. Yeah. If I, if I stayed with Saturday night live, I never would have done Amadeus. Mm. Right. Right. So it's, you know, that's the thing I was about to say, like, I wish you would have extended because, you know, I love the show and I would have loved to see you on it, but but you have also done amazing work after the fact. And, you know, we would never want to live in that universe where you're not contributing everything else you're contributing outside of SNL. So um, really really such an honor to get to talk to you. So thank you so much to Christine Ebersol for joining us. Thank Thank you, James, for this interview. This was awesome. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. I've enjoyed this immensely. Thank you, Christine. All right. On behalf of James and Christine Ebersol, my name is John Schneider from the Saturday Night Network. We will see you next time, everybody. Have a good one. Thank you so much to Christine Ebersol for joining us on SNL Stories tonight. That was so cool to talk to a cast member from all the way back in season seven. And it's always really fun to get to hear their stories and stuff that happened so many years ago at Saturday Night Live. So if you did enjoy the show, you got to let us know what you thought in the comments. I guess if you didn't as well, you can let me know. But uh, we want to see your thoughts. So please post in the comments. Uh, send us a message on social media. You can tweet to us. You can uh, comment on the Instagram post when we post about this. Just let us know what you think. And then you have to give the video a thumbs up please appreciate it it helps people find the show subscribe to the show on youtube apple podcast and spotify and of course follow us on all social platforms we need to thank our presenting partner for the show tonight latenighter.com they are so fantastic and we are grateful to work with them uh and then i also want to plug a couple things from christine ebersall so if you liked her work here you're going to love her work currently on a bob hearts abby shola i think that's the final season for that show season five i believe uh so she's currently appearing on that and she has a show in vegas on may 18th as well uh make sure to check that out from christine ebersall so uh, finally back in to SNL stories. So exciting. We also had a great feedback show on Monday in case you missed that one. If you want to go back and check out that show was a lot of fun to be on with Andrew Haynes and talk to some of the patrons. So that was great. If you're missing some SNL content right now on this break, it's a fun show to, you know, basically connect the two blocks of shows, the one that just happened and the one that's going to be happening. And then next Monday night, I'm very happy to announce that we're going to have another episode of SNL Stories, and that will be with our old friend Bobby Moynihan. We'll be returning to the podcast. Everybody seemed to really enjoy getting to hear from Bobby in December of 2022. I asked him to come back for a part two, and he's coming back. So we're very excited to talk to him. Can't wait to hear what he has to say about the show. Uh, Talk to him. Uh, Maybe we'll get to ask him about Josh Brolin a little bit uh, since he was on a couple episodes with him and then talk about some other sketches that we didn't get to ask him about last time. So really looking forward to speaking to Bobby Moynihan. All right, everybody, on behalf of James Stevens and Christine Ebersol, my name is John Schneider from the Saturday Night Network. We will see you next time. Have a good one.